Top five most horrifying killer kids. Murder is the last thing you'd expect a child to do. But just like adults, there are kids damaged beyond repair as a result of circumstances beyond their control. Sometimes, they're even just broken from the start. The next five children looked ordinary from the outside, but on the inside there was something sinister lurking. Here are the top five most horrifying killer kids. Number five, Eric Smith. At 13 years old, Eric Smith had thick aviator glasses, tussled red hair and freckles. He looked like your typical American teen, but there was something different about him. At a young age, Eric was prone to explosive anger and violence. As a toddler, he would throw tantrums and bang his head on the floor for no reason. Later on, psychiatrists would diagnose him with intermittent explosive disorder, a mental problem causing sufferers to be violent and unpredictable. Add to the fact that Eric was often bullied at school and the boy became a ticking time bomb. On August 2nd, 1983, the bomb exploded. Summer camp had started and four-year-old Derek Robbie was walking to the park where the camp was held. It was only two blocks away from his home with no streets to cross. Eric chanced upon Derek walking alone and he lured him into the nearby woods explaining there was a shortcut. Without warning, Eric began strangling the little boy until he fell to the ground unconscious. He then proceeded to pick up two large rocks, one after the other, and slam them into his head, resulting in the death of young Derek. Eric proceeded to undress the boy and sodomize him with a tree branch. He rifled through his lunch bag, smashed a banana, and dumped red Kool-Aid over his mutilated face. By 11 a.m., Derek's mother, Doreen, arrived at the park to pick up her son, but was told he didn't arrive. Shortly after, a search operation was underway, and Derek's body was found. Four days after this, Eric Smith walked into the police station and offered his help with the case. He gave information and asked questions in a somewhat gleeful way. The investigator didn't think much more of it, as it seemed simply like a child who wanted to play cop. That is, until he mentioned seeing Derek from across the street in an open field, which placed him at the crime scene. Eric was also able to describe Derek's clothes, including the lunch bag he had in his hand that day. Seven days after the murder, Smith confessed to killing Derek. He received the maximum jail sentence of nine years to life, with parole eligibility every two years after the first nine years. He's been denied every parole hearing and remains incarcerated to this day. Number four, Christopher Pittman. It was 2001 and at just 12 years old, Christopher Pittman was already getting into so much trouble that he decided to run away from home. When he was caught, he was placed in an institutional facility and given the anti-depression drug Paxil. He was then shuffled off to live with his grandparents and with the new town and new home, there came a new doctor too. The Paxil was working for Chris, but wasn't available, so his new doctor prescribed Zoloft instead. Zoloft is known to induce various side effects in children, including aggression, hallucinations, depression, and delusions. Soon after the switch, Christopher began experiencing severe side effects, including a burning sensation all over his body. It got so bad he required additional pain medication. After his grandparents complained that he still felt the side effects, oddly, his Zoloft dosage was increased from 100 milligrams each day to 200 milligrams. Christopher's behavior started becoming more erratic. He ended up choking a fellow student after an argument on the bus. Later, he disturbed the individual playing piano inside his church. That night, he got into a fight with his grandfather and received a spanking. Mad with rage, he marched inside his grandparents' bedroom, took out the shotgun which he had been taught to use, and shot both his grandparents. Using paper and candles, he then set the house on fire and took his grandparents' car, their guns, his dog, and $33 and left. Eventually picked up by police later that night, he told them he had been kidnapped by a man who killed his grandparents. After intense questioning, he eventually confessed to his crimes and even added that his grandparents deserved what they got. His trial centered on the controversial drug Zoloft and the effects it had on children. 
The doctor who doubled his dosage was never charged for any crime. Currently, Christopher Pittman is still incarcerated and serving a 30-year-to-life sentence. Number three, Joshua Phillips. It was November 3rd, 1998, and eight-year-old Maddie Clifton had disappeared. Police and volunteers searched dumpsters in the surrounding woods near her home, hoping to find some sort of clue for her whereabouts. What they didn't know was that Maddie was right across the street from her house the whole time, stuffed underneath a waterbed inside her friend and playmate, 14-year-old Joshua Phillips' bedroom. Josh had no history of violence. He claimed that one afternoon, Maddie came over and invited him to play baseball. Maddie threw the ball and he hit it, sending it back at her, accidentally hitting her in the eye, causing her to bleed. Panicked, Josh brought her inside his house. Josh's abusive father had a strict no visitors policy and afraid of what his reaction would be if he found her inside, he dragged Maddie into his bedroom and proceeded to strangle her with a phone cord for 15 minutes. Afterwards, he hit her with the baseball bat and then stabbed her 11 times. There was no evidence of sexual assault, but Maddie's body was found naked from the waist down. By the time his father had come home, Josh had stuffed Maddie's body underneath his waterbed mattress, and there it sat for several days decomposing. Police began the search party, and after days of turning up empty, they decided to call it off. Seven days after Maddie's disappearance, Josh's mom, Missy Phillips, was cleaning his bedroom when she noticed a wet spot on the floor and thought his waterbed was leaking. She lifted up the mattress to try and locate the leak, and that's when she discovered Maddie's body. In horror, she ran next door and called the police. Josh was arrested in school that day. He confessed to killing Maddie, explaining the fear of his abusive father's reaction as the motive for murdering the little girl. In 1999, Joshua Phillips was convicted of first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison without the eligibility for parole. Number two, Cindy and Shirley. 15-year-old Cindy Collier and 14-year-old Shirley Wolf had a history of abuse and brush-ins with the law. Cindy was abused her whole life and raped before she turned 10. By the time she was 15, her rap sheet included theft, burglary, drug abuse, and assault. Shirley also had a similar disruptive past. Her own father, uncle, and paternal grandfather had sexually abused her from the time she was an infant. By the time she was six, she ran away from home several times until eventually authorities took notice and her father was arrested for the abuse. After he was convicted, she was sent into various foster homes and detention centers. After meeting only eight hours before at a bus stop, the girls bonded over their mutual life circumstances and decided they would run away together. They spent time hatching a plan, which involved killing a stranger, then stealing their car. Both girls dyed their hair as a feeble attempt at disguising themselves and went around Cindy's old neighborhood, Auburn Greens in California. They began knocking on doors, and while the majority didn't let them inside their home, finally, one elderly woman did. Anna Brackett, an 85-year-old with grandkids of her own, allowed them in. The girls asked to use the phone, and they chatted with the victim for about an hour. At some point, Anna answered a phone call from her son, who was en route to drive her off to a bingo game. Knowing they had little time, the girls attacked. Cindy grabbed a knife, tossed it to Shirley, who immediately began stabbing Brackett in the back over and over again. Anna begged for her life, but the girls kept going until she was dead. After the kill, the girls ransacked the place, looked for cash, and grabbed two keys from the counter. The keys they took were the wrong ones for the 1970 Dodge in the garage, and so the girls ran on foot near Highway 49. Oddly enough, Carl Brackett, the son of the victim, saw the two girls while he was on his way to his mother's home. Once he got there, he discovered the grisly scene. Eyewitnesses eventually came forward, which led to the girls becoming suspects. Once confronted by police, Shirley immediately admitted to the crime, while Cindy didn't say anything. During interrogation, Cindy was confronted with Shirley's confession, and she began to laugh. She then said, To honestly tell you the truth, we didn't feel any badness. Then after we did it, we wanted to do another one. We just wanted to kill someone, just for fun.
Both girls were convicted of the crime, with Cindy serving the maximum of nine years for a juvenile. She was then paroled in 1992 and has had no further run-ins with the law. As for Wolf, she was freed on June 30th, 1995, and has been arrested several times since for petty crimes. Number one, Tyler Hadley. July 16th, 2011. Everyone at school could tell it was going to be a big party. 17-year-old Tyler Hadley from Port St. Lucie, Florida, kept telling his friends he'd be throwing a rager, but no one thought it would happen. He'd been getting in trouble lately, and as a result, his parents were being extra strict with him. But Tyler had no intentions of letting his parents get in the way of his fun. Around 5 p.m., several hours before the party, Tyler popped some ecstasy, grabbed a hammer from the garage, and marched inside his family room where his mom, Mary Jo, was on the computer working. Tyler stood behind her, and as she turned to face him, he struck her on top of the head. Hearing her screams, Tyler's dad, Blake, came rushing into the room. When Blake asked why he was doing this, Tyler's only reply was, why the hell not? He then bludgeoned his father to death, finished off his mother, and dragged their bodies to their bedroom, where he began piling clothes and furniture on top of them. He locked the bedroom door and cleaned for about three hours, just in time for his guests to arrive. By 11 p.m., the party was in full swing. Close to 60 kids were inside the house that night. They were playing beer pong, stubbing cigarettes everywhere, smashing bottles, and trashing the house. A few of them later recalled sitting down at the computer, taking turns playing songs on YouTube and noticing a brown, sticky substance, which they assumed to be coke or beer. Later on, it was found to be Mary Jo's blood, which Tyler had tried to get rid of using coffee granules. The party kept going while Tyler's behavior bobbed from panicky to gleeful. At some point, he told his best friend what happened detailing how he killed his parents, even showing him a bloody footprint in the garage before ultimately revealing their bodies in the bedroom. By 4.40 a.m., the police arrived. His friend Michael Mandel had called Crime Stoppers to report the murder, and Tyler was arrested when the police discovered the horrifying sight. Tyler's explanations for the crime varied. First, he blamed medications he was taking, then said his father was not his real dad and insinuated he was physically abusive. Neither of these were true. Finally, he admitted that it was because he wanted to throw a party, but knew his parents would object to it. Tyler Hadley was originally charged with first degree murder and sentenced to life with no chance of parole. But as of 2016, his case will be open for resentencing due to the Supreme Court 2012 ruling that barred minors from receiving life imprisonment without parole. So those were the top five most horrifying killer kids. Whether these children were a product of their environment, simply born evil, or perhaps a mix of both, the thought that a young person can commit such a terrible act like murdering is truly disturbing. Let us know which case you found the most horrifying in the comments below. And if you like this video, please remember to subscribe to our channel and each week we promise to give you a new scary mystery to watch. Hope you enjoyed this one, and thanks so much for watching.